Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our Q2 interest rate webinar. For those of you who recognize my voice, I'm Sarah Conklin, co-host of the Rate Guy podcast, and as JP loves to say, the real boss here at Pensford. Now, before we get started, there's a few housekeeping notes. Um, presentation slides will be sent out to everyone after the webinar, so be on the lookout for that. And we'll also be doing a Q&A at the end, so please put your questions in the chat and JP will answer a few of them after the presentation. And now without further ado, here is the man, the myth, the rate guy, JP Conklin. How long did you practice that one? I, that was the first time I tried actually. <laughs> Good execution. Thank you. Uh, one other housekeeping note because the real boss at Pensford wants to make sure that we pay the bills occasionally. So she makes me include a little brag sheet about us. Um, so for those who have never worked with us, we really have two companies versus Pensford, which is an interest rate advisory firm. Um, we're one of the biggest players in the market. And I would say what really differentiates us is, uh, our focus on long-term relationships. And I think that we add a lot of value in between the transactions, helping with strategy, making sure clients stay on top of proactive opportunities, uh, and things of that nature. And then Loan Boss is a software company round debt management that we launched about three years ago. Um, and it's just taken off to the moon. And so we're having a blast uh, running a software company as well. Um, because Father's Day is this Sunday, we thought that we would honor the dads on this webinar by sprinkling in some dad jokes. So you can see there in the bottom left-hand corner, why did the rates webinar put everyone to sleep? Because the content had no interest. So if that made you groan, buckle up. There's going to be a few more throughout here. <laughs> um, if you're looking for PhD level humor, you're on the wrong webinar. Well, feel free to contact one of the big banks that you guys work with. Um, before we get started, Sarah, do you have any favorite dad jokes? I do, actually. Um, if you're American when you're in the bathroom and you're American when you come out of the bathroom, what are you when you're in the bathroom? I don't know. European. Get it? <laughs> no, I got it. Yeah, thanks. I would have guessed that going into the bathroom, I was Russian, and coming out of the bathroom, I was Finnish. Oh, very clever. Well, yeah. good add on. That's nice. <laughs> Any others before we get started? Uh, it's another bathroom humor uh, for those that love it. Uh, why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? A pterodactyl like the dinosaur? Like the dinosaur. Yep. No, no clue. Be because the P is silent. Okay. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> I think we just heard a thousand collective groans as we get started. Yeah. <clears throat> people and are I'll, dropping off of rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's get to the good stuff. Uh, I'll see you all at the end. Uh, enjoy the webinar. All right. So before we jump into sort of the overview of the market and our thoughts on interest rates, I thought it might make sense to kind of compare the first half of last year to the first half of this year. It's really a tale of two first halves. I suspect there's a lot of people on this call who have a very similar experience, which is essentially the first half of last year was maybe the best year ever. Uh, and then ever since then, um, transaction volume has been down pretty considerably. So we went back and kind of compared and just looking at caps that they make up the majority of our volume. We, we do a lot of defeasances, we do a lot of swaps, and then we do more exotic structures, but caps kind of dominate the space. Um, and new caps, sort of like new financing, last year was 95% the first half of the year, and that's down to 64%. Uh, I was probably a little surprised that it was as high as 64%. I probably would have guessed it was lower than that, um, but maybe the, the lending mark's not quite as dead um, as it feels. The other one is extensions, jumps out at me. A lot more extensions, and I suspect that that number is going to continue to climb over the next year to year and a half. Um, notably, the cap provider market share has shifted pretty dramatically. Um, this has been ongoing for a couple of years. Um, I happen to have two really close friends who are very senior at both Wells and U.S. Bank. And for several years now, we've been working arm in arm in trying to provide a more competitive marketplace. Um, we still have a very deep relationship with SMBC, but they have um, taken far less of the market share. Uh, Goldman's still hovering in around 2% of the deals that we work on. I would say that they're most competitive on really large, really complex structures. Um, SMBC and Goldman are generally the two banks that will bid on anything without any relationship, without checking anything. Um, 
Wells and U.S. Bank want a more negotiated structure, but they'll tell you what margin they need to make on the front end in order to justify the transaction. Um, we've had a lot of success with both of those, and I would say Wells and U.S. Bank have both made tremendous strides in the documentation standpoint. SNBC has always been the class leader as it relates to um, documentation, post-trade documentation. Everything is painless. Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank have kind of caught up to SNBC on that front. Cap terms, um, you can see we're majority is now one year, uh, and I suspect that that will continue. Um, three years is down to just 7%, um, pretty pretty infrequent. And then the average ready cap strike is up quite a bit from 336 to 528. So interesting dynamic, thought we'd just give you an overview of what we're seeing in the market. Um, you guys may not see that sort of detail, just like we don't necessarily see all the loan transactions, but thought it'd be interesting to share some of that stuff. Um, obviously on the cap front, kind of been a roller coaster. Not only did they jump, then they fell, then they jumped again, then they fell again. And over the last month or so, they have surged again. We're not quite back to the peak, but almost. Um, the last five weeks, we've seen the two-year treasury up almost 100 basis points. And so that's not about the, the Fed adding hikes as much as it's about the market taking out cuts. So the market had been really aggressive in the number of cuts that it was projecting. Um, we thought way too aggressive. It has backed out a ton of cuts, about a point to a point and a half over the next three years. That's reflected in these cap costs. Uh, volatility is still elevated. We follow the uh, B of A move index um, as, as opposed to the VIX, which is equities. And so it surged during SVB. It settled back down, but we're still kind of close to the levels that we experienced at the worst parts of COVID. So this is still an extremely elevated period of time from a volatility standpoint in the rates market. Traders are just waiting for that all clear signal from the Fed to say, we're done. You don't have to price in 6%. You don't have to price in 7%. We're leveling off here. We're done. And the next move is going to be a cut. And we just can't seem to get over the hump and get to that part. Whenever we get to that part, this is graph we've been, we've been including for about a year now, is the other side of it should provide quite a bit of relief. It doesn't take long. And so you have a couple of factors that drive cap prices dropping after the last hike. And that is number one, the forward curve starts downward sloping. They start pricing in those cuts. Once we see they're done, get on the other side. Let's say we get to the fall and they haven't hiked anymore. Cap prices are going to start coming back down. Um, forward curve says, you know, so for to two and a half percent, an option trader can charge you a ton less. Um, the other reason is the volatility component. You can take that six and seven percent possibility that what feels like an outlier, you can take it off the table if you're an option trader. Again, go back to December 2021, that said they weren't going to be hiking at all in 2022. You're a trader selling a cap in that environment, you got bit. And so right now you're a little gun shy. You're charging extra for everything. You're very defensive. And you're not for sure that we're not going to six. You don't think so, but you got to charge something in order pr to protect yourself. One of the things that we've seen in this market that's pretty interesting is forward starting caps are now cheaper than spot starting caps. And that makes sense because you're looking at a different part of the curve, right? But normally there's a forward premium that goes along with that. And the market's charging you extra to hedge something in the future. That is totally offset by the drop in the forward curve. So as you can see here, um, year one is almost half of the cost of the cap on a three-year cap. And it's kind of evenly divided between years two and three. Um, this is important to note. If you have to buy a cap in the future and you don't think you're going to be refinancing or selling that property, because if you have to buy it in, let's say, January, you might want to start monitoring those prices. So right now we're working with a lot of clients to say, you know, tell us all the caps you got mature in the next two years that you think you're going to have to buy replacement caps for. We'll start pricing them up as if you bought it today and what the market thinks is going to be in the future. And then if it gets to a point where it makes a lot of sense for you to move forward, you just move forward. You're not starting that that um, project when it's too late. Get get the wheels in motion now and then monitor and then move forward if you choose to. Um, also important to note, as the yield curve uninverts, which is probably about 12 months out uh, before a substantial uninversion, we think that this phenomenon will, will reverse itself. This is crucial for the people who are, are sort of debating with Freddie about, hey, you know, I think my escrow should be based on that forward starting replacement cap. Freddie is going to say, rightfully so, that's an anomaly in the market. And if you if you want me to do that, just remember when the curve uninverts, that forward starting cap is going to be more expensive. Now I'm going to use that same methodology when the curve uninverts, and it's going to be more expensive. 
to price those escrows once we get out of this inverted yield curve. So be careful what you wish for if you're trying to press for, hey, use that forward starting cap um, to calculate my escrows. Here's an example. We do a lot of agency hedging, obviously. Um, so escrows have been top of mind for everybody. And one of the things we've seen really recently, the last month or so has, has kind of wiped this out, but I would at least put it on your radar so you can begin monitoring it in case it happens again, which is, hey, let's go ahead and buy a replacement cap, even if I have term remaining, because I want to press the reset button on the escrows. So I have a year remaining, six months remaining. I go ahead and I buy a three-year cap. And then that presses the reset button on the escrows and it spreads them out over three years. And I don't have to take the, the escrow that I was just recalculated a couple months ago and run that out until the next recalc period. Makes less sense today than it did five weeks ago, but I would at least be monitoring that if you have caps that you're gonna be replacing the next sort of six to 12 months, start, go, start going through this exercise now. And if the cap prices come down, look to move forward and say, you know what? They've, they've cut in half. Let me buy a three-year instead of a one-year because I think I'm going to be in this thing for a while, and I'm going to spread those escrows out over a longer, longer period of time. We get asked this question a ton, um, and this is, can my counterparty pay me, right? And, and most people who have caps with like SNBC say, hey, can SNBC pay me? And the answer is yes. SNBC is not making a bet against you. The other banks are not made, making a bet against you. They're just playing the middleman. Right. When you execute that hedge, they are laying that risk off in the market. Right. And so then the natural follow up question is, well, does that mean that that counterparty needs to be able to pay my counterparty to make sure I get paid? And the answer is no, that's not how they manage that risk. They manage it in, in a term of terms um, and notional amount. So. I get longer in the three year section. I want to go hedge myself by getting shorter in the three year sector. That's it. It's not tied to a specific hedge. I've got a book with a mark to market on it that I'm managing kind of like a, a seesaw that goes up and down. And I want to kind of try to keep it balanced. So they don't do it on a trade by trade basis. There's no like thread you can pull and track it down to, to your final hedge. Um, furthermore, most caps and certainly the ones that we work on have downgrade triggers included. And that way, if something were to happen with one of these lenders, you would have some remedies. Right. And I think the very first thought people have is, well, does that mean that they've defaulted in that example? And the answer is no. They have an opportunity to like post collateral, get a guarantee from a higher rated agency uh, or assign it to another bank. Right. And these are the sort of things that go into the pricing when you guys are getting those caps, because a bank's looking forward to saying, OK, well, if I have to assign this to somebody else, how much is that bank going to charge me to take this risk off my books? And I've got to account for that when I'm pricing this on the front end to sell the cap to you guys. So a lot goes into that. And that's why the higher the credit ratings, the more expensive it is because the bank's saying, Hey, this is onerous. You're going to leave me with only one bank to assign this to in the future. And that bank, that bank is going to have all the leverage. They're going to know I have to assign it to them and they're going to charge me a lot to do that. Therefore I have to charge you a lot. If you want me to have, you know, for example, double A um, ratings in it, just because a bank gets downgraded doesn't mean that they stop paying you. Right, goes back to these remedies and likely to still keep paying you. And then this is a really big, important takeaway is interest rate derivatives have always posted collateral between banks at the end of each day. So if you go back to the financial crisis, I was working at Wachovia and when we traded with other banks, our exposure would change all day long. We would get longer or shorter. Well, at the end of each day, we each had a back office operation that calculated the net change to the exposure. And then we would post treasuries to each other, right? That is totally different than credit default swaps, which did not collateralize with treasuries and is a key reason why they were a big part of the financial crisis. So during the financial crisis, interest rate derivatives behaved pretty well. It was really only the unsecured ones that, that didn't do, do very well. Much better than credit default swaps. So even though they both use the word swap, two totally different instruments and they were treated totally different. So right now you think about the banks that we, we talked about on one of those first few pages, they're posting treasuries to each other to secure that exposure. And so they know if bank XYZ gets into trouble, cut them off. And at least I know I've limited my risk to the last trading day and I'm likely to be able to weather the storm. Um, I was on the other end of that at Wachovia when we started to go under and I was talking to the head of our trading desk and he said, no one will trade with us. It doesn't matter if we post treasuries, they're done. We can't hedge our position anymore. 
So they had identified Wachovia as a bank that was probably going under. They weren't going to trade with us anymore. They cut off our exposure as of that day, and they had treasuries to collateralize themselves and limit their losses going forward. We've got a link at the bottom here when we send out the slides. We have a whole white paper about some of this stuff um, that you guys can click on and go investigate. A uh, couple big things. So LIBOR, um, it will be uh, no longer published after June 30th. Um, there's, there should not be a huge impact to anybody at this point. We've spent a lot of time doing LIBOR modifications. If your lender hasn't made that change by June 30th, the wheels don't fall off. It'll still be a highly effective hedge. You might just have some mismatch as it, as it defaults to a fallback. Um, Freddie and Fannie have language specifically in their confirms where you really don't have to do anything. So you're okay on that front. And then more recently is the regulators are starting to say, hey, listen, those alternatives that were proposed over the last few years, such as Bisbee and Ameribor, are really probably not going to be allowed to stick around. So there was a big push. Um, Bisbee in particular um, was used by like B of A and PNC. It was a big push because traders preferred that over uh, SOFR. And Ameribor, probably not a lot of use on, on this webinar. It's usually for regional banks as they hedge their own portfolio. Um, not how they would make loans to you guys or hedges, but Bisbee definitely does. And so there may come a time in the, in the next few years where we have to go back and modify some of those Bisbee hedges to more accurately reflect a uh, SOFR transition. Obviously, we had a FOMC meeting yesterday. It's not a coincidence. I scheduled this webinar for the day after. I am shockingly accurate with the benefit of hindsight. Um, I knew everything they were going to say, and you can't prove me wrong because I refuse to uh, commit to any opinions ahead of time. I would say that this meeting probably caught a lot of people off guard. Obviously, not me. Uh, I knew all this was going to happen. But a couple key things is the median takeaway from the dots was two more hikes. Right, so upper end of the bound is would be 575 in that example. Keep in mind that those dots are just an anonymous forecast of individual participants. So they each sort of fill out a survey, they turn it in, they get aggregated, and you spit out the numbers. So it's not as if they all got together and said, "Hey, what do you think the reasonable number is? You know, two more hikes. Let's put that down and let everybody know we're hiking two more times." Out of the 18 participants, only two expect no more hikes. I, am, I speculate that one of those two is Pal. Based on the way that he's talking, I think he's one of the people who says we're done. Um, four, expect one more hike. So that would put us up so for around five and a half on the high end. Nine, expect two more hikes. Two, expect three more hikes. And then one outlier thinks we're going north of six, right? So given that sort of what feels like dissent to me, it was shocking to me there wasn't any dissension. It was a unanimous vote to not hike, and I think that that's a big deal. I think it suggests that there was maybe some backroom agreements going on where Powell said, hey, listen, it's important that we present a unified front at this point. We might be hitting an inflection point. Let's make sure we don't disperse and have five dissensions here. Let's stay on the same page. In exchange, why don't you guys just raise your forecast? That will send a hawkish signal and still convince the market we have more work to do. Um, number two, my takeaway, and this again is, is me thinking that they're probably done, is those projections probably overstate the likelihood of more hikes. Um, I don't actually think it's going to be that, that many hikes. I'm not convinced we'll even have one more. But that's because of the number, number three, which is it's really, that statement was about keeping a lid on expectations. That's really where, where Powell doesn't want to lose any ground. If he can keep a lid on expectations in the market and consumers believe expectation or uh, inflation is going to be constrained, he's winning and he doesn't have to hike anymore. He's basically shifted into it's more about time than peak from here going forward. It doesn't make any sense to me that 5% didn't do it, but one more 25 basis point hike suddenly wins the war on inflation. I think that's an absurd argument. So to me, it's more about convincing the market that, hey, inflation is definitely moving down, might not be as fast as we want, but there's no real benefit to doing one more 25 basis point hike. Like, what's that going to do? It takes a year to work its way through the system. If we hike right now, it's not going to help July's numbers. So let's just instead just focus on we did 5% in 12 months. Let's give it some time to work its way through the system. Um, I thought it was notable what he did not say, which was he could have been way more explicit about hiking in July. Um, ECB hiked this morning, and the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, said, we are highly likely to be hiking in July. <laughs> and so why didn't Powell say something like that? If there is so much hawkish uh, agreement at the Fed, and everyone is so convinced there are this many hikes, 
kind of weird that we skipped a meeting and that Powell wasn't more explicit about that. And so I think this is one of those things where they pause, but they're hoping these signals kind of keep a expectation lid and they're not actually going to hike again. Um, the other, last point is there's not a ton of data between now and July 26th meeting. So I don't really know what they would expect to see that would cause them to hike or not to hike other than what we already have. So we get another PCE, another CPI, another jobs report. Unless one of them really reverses course, I would be tough, hard pressed to say they need to hike again because inflation is suddenly surging. So I don't really buy it. I think I could be convinced that there maybe is one more hike. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they hike in July, but I don't think they will. I would be very surprised if they hike two more times. The next meeting is not till September. That will come after the uh, Jackson Hole meeting, which is the end of August, which is usually when they announce um, sort of big thematic shifts. I suspect they will sort of reassure the market they're done at the Jackson Hole meeting. So even if we have one more, they're probably going to use Jackson Hole to say we are done, unless we see inflation reverse. The summary of economic projections is those anonymous forecasts, but not just around rates, it's also around some other key economic drivers. So we'll start with Fed funds up here. You can see the big change was last meeting or two meetings ago, because they do this every other meeting, 5.1 was the expected Fed funds at year end, now it's 5.6, so we're up half a point, right? Um, that's a pretty gradual change over the next couple of years, not that much, but Powell will be the first one to tell you like, we don't know anything about 2024 at this point. We, we have no confidence about 2023, let alone the next couple of years. Um, core PCE shifted up, right? They're acknowledging it's coming down slower than expected. We're now up to 3.9 by year end. If it continues to be stubborn, that's gonna be, have a four handle two meetings from now. Uh, longer term inflation, you know, very conveniently still ends up around 2%. GDP, this is key. They're basically saying there's no chance of recession anymore. They're, they're taking a recession off the table by this revision, which flies in the face of where they think unemployment's going, which is still 4.5. It's just going to be next year instead of this year. We've never had unemployment go up by a percent and not end up in a recession. So these unemployment and GDP revisions don't actually match up with each other. Um, and I think that's because these are just synonymous forecasts. This isn't like an agreement today that they ran out. Everybody just submits their numbers. They take the median. So it only takes a handful of voters to change their mind the next time around. And suddenly the dots say only one more hike. So I wouldn't read too much into this, but it does say they've acknowledged inflation is more stubborn. Growth is a little bit better than expected. Unemployment is going to be a little bit lower than expected. And we're still pausing which to me is a pretty key takeaway. Why would they be pausing if all of these other numbers imply strength? They must feel that the work is done. So on the floating rate front, um, you can see sort of year end, FOMC same 560, markets like 520, so average around 540. Next year, everybody's in agreement there are some cuts. You know, the Fed's about a point of cuts, markets a little bit more. Uh, anything after that really kind of irrelevant. Um, Market saying, we still think you're probably going to have to cut before year end. You can see um, at, the, at the next meeting, there's a 65% chance of a hike. I think that's overstating, but 60% is considered sort of a very key threshold. Once odds are over 60%, if the, if the Fed disagrees, they'll speak up. So I'll be looking at Fed speak in the next four to six weeks to say, is that the correct number? That's how we'll know whether or not they're hiking. Um, the other interesting thing is Powell accidentally used the word skip, and then he caught himself, and he's like, oh, I shouldn't refer to this as a skip. And the reason he said that is because a skip implies that they're hiking at the next meeting. So um, some people took that to mean they're definitely hiking in July, and I can understand that interpretation. Um, I think it was just a, a mess up, but we'll see. Um, keep an eye on these odds. If they stay north of 60 and the Fed is actually thinking that they're not hiking, they'll come out and say things in order to put those expectations down. On the long end of the curve, the 10-year part of the curve, you know, market's 367, a kind of 302. That, the 302 feels too low to me. Um, the data feels strong enough. We're in this weird period where the data is still good enough from all the momentum we had that it doesn't feel bad. It's like this false euphoria that we all have about, you know, potentially having a soft landing, and the reality hasn't begun to set in yet. Um, I suspect that 
the three percent number is probably early second half of next year. Um, low end of the range is like three and a quarter, three thirty, and the high end of the range is about three ninety. And so we're probably range bound for the foreseeable future. Um, you guys have seen this before. I'll drop it in here again. But basically, the market underestimates the bottom falling out at some point. We always think this time is different. Ends up not being different. The only exception was the '94 case where they took out. 75 basis points pretty quickly. That basically gave them more room to run and rates were level for a while. Otherwise, you get about a year out from the pause and rates start coming down. You get two years out and they're down considerably. There is, however, some precedent for a pause. And so it's not a lot. This hiked every other meeting was basically the trend. They just never hiked every meeting. So they just basically were already skipping the meetings. That one doesn't count in my mind. These two examples are 20 to 30 years old, and they did skip some meetings right at the tail end of the tightening cycle. So there is some precedent that they skip this, uh, skip this meeting and they hike in July. There's not a lot of precedent. Um, and then you've got Jay Powell catching himself, which some, some believe is the signal that they're definitely hiking in July. The yield curve inversion, we've been talking about this for over a year now. Wells had did a great um, study that concluded the depth of the inversion is less important than the duration of the inversion. Once you get over a year, the recession that follows is more significant. And so we're at the one year mark. It feels like the recession is going to be worse than it would have otherwise been. But the Fed is so intent on breaking inflation that they just have to keep things um, tight. You can see we're down at some pretty deep inversion periods here. And we're now, there really is no precedent for the two-year treasury being this far below Fed funds without the Fed cutting. So we are sort of in uncharted waters at this point. Um, what's interesting is on the day of the first hike, which is March 16th of 2022, the first cut was priced in for March of 2024, two years later, right? Now, the peak was 243, but look what happened. The first cut kept getting pulled forward <laughs> and just pulled forward and then pulled forward. Remember, there was this time earlier this year where the market was pricing cuts in the summer, and we're like, that's crazy. There's no way that's happening. Markets now basically brought us full circle. We're back out to spring of 2024 with a much higher peak. So market started March 2024, ended February 2024 with just a lot of uh, oscillations in between. On average, once the Fed starts cutting, they usually cut by about half within about 15 months. So if I personally believe that they start cutting Q1 of next year, that means by the middle of 2025, they're probably done. And SOFR is back down to somewhere between two and a half and three. We laid this all out here. You can see there's, there's not a ton of great correlation, but in general, it ends up being around 50% of, of the peak. Um, that probably lends itself to people who believe we're not going back to zero again. Uh, it'll be tougher to go back down to zero barring some sort of uh, collapse. It also means there's not a great correlation between the speed of the hikes and the speed of the cuts. So you can see here, there's really no correlation. What ends up happening is it's the significance of what causes the cuts that dictates how much do they cut. If it's a financial crisis, if it's a global pandemic, we're going back to zero, right? That's on the table. If it is just a you know, normal old fashioned recession, we're not going back down to zero. And I think that Powell personally wants to avoid going to zero again. I think he will really try hard to sort of stop between two and a half and 3% as much as possible. Real Fed funds, which is basically how you measure adjusted for inflation has turned positive. That means it's restrictive, right? So real rates, quote unquote, are restrictive at this point. It's essentially just what is Fed funds minus CPI. You're around you know, one and a quarter right now. Um, CPI was at 4.9 last month, came in at four this week. If we see another significant drop, this that implies that this will be even higher. We'll be moving towards 2%, which not coincidentally is where 10-year rates have been for a little while. So 10-year real rates have been positive um, for a significant amount of time. This is very restrictive. Part of the reason that we're experiencing such a slowdown in real estate volume is because of these sort of real rates. Powell himself said at the last press conference, he believes real rates are somewhere around 2%, and he believes that that is highly restrictive. So in his mind, we've hit restrictive territory. He doesn't have to keep hiking to get us into restrictive territory. We're there, right? And as inflation keeps coming down, it just naturally moves us into greater and greater restrictive territory. 
Like I said, the 10 years is probably pretty range bound for the foreseeable future. We need a catalyst to break out. It's almost unforeseeable for me that we break to the high side. I have a tough time envisioning 10 year breaking through 390 and, you know, testing 4% or getting through 4%. There's just too much negative momentum out there. Um, probably the only thing right now would be some sort of supply issue with the treasury supply. There's going to be a lot of supply coming up to make up for the debt ceiling. But even then, like there's plenty of pent up demand for treasury. So I just don't see that happening. Uh, the downside, however, is we need to wait for that data to get weak enough to to bust through three and a quarter and it just hasn't been you get a good enough job report and it probably puts off the 10-year testing 330 for another month until the next job report right so i suspect we're range bound for the foreseeable future and this is not just a u.s thing this is a global tightening and so what we saw was last couple of years you know we've been sending out graphs about how global negative yielding debt is 18 trillion dollars like it's just sort of mind-blowing that's gone we got that down to zero we're at around two trillion right now essentially zero this is a global tightening and this will have global ramifications that's why i think that we're going to see a significant slowdown in the next 12 to 18 months from where, where we've been um it's just really really painful out there so for Father's Day, I thought we would also highlight some of my most memorable uh, Father's Day gifts. And so we'll start with my third most um, memorable gift, which is the gift that kept on giving for about five or six years while our daughter was in, in dance. And the recitals, the annual recitals were always scheduled for Father's Day. And I was just so grateful that I got to spend about 15 hours in an auditorium packed with thousands of people screaming at the top of their lungs. So I could watch my daughter dance, you know, three different times, the exact same routine for less than two minutes each. Um, so I think at the tail end of that, I realized the reason that this always falls on Father's Day is because the moms are scheduling the recitals. And so uh, I w wasn't that heartbroken when my daughter gave up dancing. Uh, but that's probably my third most favorite. Uh, before this is over, I'll give you my uh, top two as well. So let's lead into inflation. Um, everybody knows inflation has been more stubborn than expected, but on the expectations front, it's actually been going pretty well. Paul's probably pretty happy with how expe expectations are going. Uh, one year forward expectations in particular have come down quite a bit. If you go back to the peak from when he started hiking, it was it was pretty ugly, and I think was probably the catalyst for him moving so aggressively. He really wanted to pull those down. Um, you guys have seen our hairy chart before, where we talk about how inaccurate the forward curve is. Same thing with inflation. In market consistently overestimates how much inflation is going to fall, and these gray lines are what the market thought on any any given moment, just like with the forward curve graph, and then the solid blue line is what actually ended up happening we're repeating the exact same pattern, right? Like this is probably going to come down, but it's gonna come down slower than we would like or, or that we would expect. Now, one of the big drivers of this is money supply. So money supply surged during the pandemic, but has collapsed. And really this is the first time in history. There are some little bumps here. And if you stand this back 60 years, you'll see the same thing. Money supply has grown pretty consistently up until this point, then it spiked and now it has fallen off a cliff. That is gonna have an impact on inflation. There's no way around it. Uh, we're returning to this sort of trend line here. Um, velocity of money similarly fell off of a cliff and now it has returned to the trend. I don't expect this to be a totally normal return to trend. Like there's gonna be noise, it's gonna be bumpy, but it's clear that we are moving in the right direction for, for the sort of things that will dramatically cool off inflation over the next year or so. One of the big reasons I believe that we experienced so much inflation was excess savings. Basically all that helicopter money that got dumped on the economy went into people's bank accounts and they started spending it, right? In particular, they spent it on uh, goods initially because they couldn't go anywhere with it, right? Well, here's the bad news. All that money has been spent. Trillions of dollars has been spent, right? And it's gone. They're actually upside down. You're starting to see debt increase because people haven't adjusted their spending habits. They're still spending as if they have stimulus money. That's going to have ramifications on inflation. And then trueflation, one of our readers sent this to us, um, actually has a different measure than CPI. And they believe that it peaked around 12% last summer and is now down to sub 3%. 
And so it believes that CPI is way too backward looking, uh, in particular the shelter component. And the real inflation that we're feeling in the economy today is more, more like 3%. Uh, if you go to their website, you can download their data source. Um, I think it's like 700 bucks. You can download it and just do whatever you want with it for those of you who are sort of inflation geeks. Um, for me, producer price index is a better leading indicator because it's a little bit earlier in the supply chain, right? These are the people who are manufacturing these things, falling off a cliff, right? Uh, we, we're now getting towards dangerously close to deflationary periods uh, with producer price impacts, including core numbers. Like these are dramatic drops over the last year. Uh, CPI tends to follow this. It's slower, mostly because of that shelter component. But even the shelter component has leveled off, right? We're starting to first see this. Uh, we had borrowers telling us as early as last summer, like this is wrong. CPI is wrong because the, the rents have totally changed. They're, they haven't fallen off a cliff necessarily, but they're not anything like they, they were before. It just will take forever for that to show up in the CPI. The Fed is aware of this, and I think that they're starting to account for this. And so for me, I look at CPI coming in at you know 4.0% and say, yep, it's going to keep falling, even if services inflation is high, because the shelter component is going to keep, keep plunging. So this is... Um, for those of you who don't follow the SNBC uh, economist, he's a great economist. Um, SNBC made a major investment in their econ research department last year. And so we rely heavily on SNBC's research team and they do an awesome job. And these are two of the graphs that, that they put out recently, which basically implied, hey, the goods inflation that we felt, that was because it had surged during COVID and now it's starting to level off and it's gonna come back down. The goods component is starting to dissipate. Conversely, services, you weren't allowed to do anything, so there, you really weren't spending money on anything other than what Amazon could deliver to your house, has surged dramatically, right? Now we're back on trend, and so now we would expect this to level off. And so SNBC's thesis is essentially these sort of things are conspiring to rein in inflation uh, at the exact same time that the shelter component is also starting to catch up with all the adjustments we've seen since last summer. The other interesting thing is inflation doesn't tend to level off very well. It, it doesn't do what we all think it does and what the, you know, the, the Fed um, forecast suggests, which is just level off and play nice and bump along at 2%. Like that's probably not going to happen. Um, here you can see like we're, we're falling rapidly. We'll probably blow through this. Then we'll see it bounce around and we'll just see it go up and down as they try to uh, regulate as best as possible. It's nearly impossible. It doesn't do that. What I do think is important to acknowledge is the Fed is going to stop or the Fed is going to start cutting before we get to 2%, right? They're not going to wait to get to 2 before they start cutting. By then, it's too late. Uh, they're, they've got to head in the right direction. And I think if you were to ask Pal, hey, CPI was at 9.1 10 months ago. 10 months later, it's at 4.0. Is that a win? I think he would say yes. I think he's probably bummed about um, the core numbers being a little stickier and more stubborn than he would like but they're not losing the battle. It's just taking longer than expected. Um, interesting to note. So I think for those who've been on these webinars before, I don't believe that the labor market is as strong as, as everybody else seems to think. Um, unemployment prior to recession starts climbing and it usually bottoms out about five months before the start of the recession. And so last month is likely the bottom, right? We had that three, four, uh, four number. And we've climbed, we're up to 3.7 now. If that continues, that would imply a recession being on the table around October, fall timeline. My suspicion is that that's a little bit too soon, but I don't think it's impossible. I think we had enough momentum and enough sort of like residual energy that we will continue to be doing okay. Um, but there's a recession coming and unemployment climbing is one of those key indicators. Um, it doesn't peak, however, until after the recession. So look how it, it peaks after the gray bars, right? We won't, we won't see the peak until we've actually exited the recession, usually. Um, and that's why the Fed's not going to wait until we get to 2% before they start cutting. It'll be too late at that point. They've got things moving in the right direction. Now they're just trying to balance between stopping too soon or waiting too long. Uh, if you look at private measures, wage growth way down. Um, that's one of the big things that Powell has always indicated in tightness of the labor market. Like private uh, measures, painting a different picture than what, what the BLS is putting out, right? And I think that these guys like LinkedIn uh, indeed have a way better insight into leading indicators than the U.S. government does. Those guys are all saying the slowdown is dramatic. It just hasn't shown up yet. Um, 
You guys have all seen this before. We've been pounding the table with this. It would be odd that we weren't adding 200,000 jobs every month at this stage of the tightening cycle. So this is not a surprise. It'd be weird if we weren't, right? In fact, job losses don't usually start until after the Fed has started cutting rates. So there's a really good chance we are still adding jobs all year long and we don't actually see negative non-farm payrolls until after the Fed has started cutting sometime next year. That would not be an anomaly. Um, meanwhile, jobless claims have jumped. And this is a pretty dramatic surge. They're up about 40% off of the falls bottom. Um, this is a big number. So keep an eye on this. If you see these stay up here, then it's probably a signal. The labor market is about to slow down considerably and very quickly. Uh, and I think that speaking of you know jobless claims, I think of my kids who none have a job. Um, but while we were thinking about what to do for Father's Day, they decided to surprise me with my second most uh, memorable Father's Day gift ever, which was a water park visit. And what better way to visit a water park than to put it indoors where the screaming kids' echoes um, fill your ears. So it was a very endearing uh, trip for us. And then I think what I most appreciated about this visit was that there's also a hotel attached to it. So you didn't even have to leave the building. You got to stay there and really enjoy the chlorine even from the privacy of your own room. So thank you to the family for that one. Um, lastly, we'll wrap up with sort of the overarching financial conditions. If you're looking for a reason why the Fed is doing a good job, this is probably it, right? We moved into restrictive territory. We came back down and now we're kind of bumping along around neutral. Like I think Powell's probably pretty happy with this. We came off of the bottom and we haven't flipped over yet. So it's probably pretty good. You know, we had, this was October. We got kind of uh, hairy. We came back down and we're settling in. This would be exhibit A for Fed doing a good job with a soft landing. They tend to view anything above this gray dash line as being restrictive, right? And anything below this is accommodative. So you could see we came out of the most accommodative period ever. And now they're trying to achieve this soft landing where they cool things off without toppling us over into a recession. Um, here's a good reason why we might avoid a recession, which is generally you can avoid a recession if only rates or oil go up, right? If they both go up, you pretty much always have a recession. If only one goes up, you can avoid a recession. So it looked bad for a while with oil surging. Oil has plunged. Uh, and so there is some chance that we're going to see that. The problem is, I think it's plunged for the wrong reasons. It's a demand issue. WTI was below 70 this morning. I think that's largely to do with um, China reopening being kind of a flop. Like that did not do to the world economy what we thought it might do. And so to me, that's actually a bad sign. But there is some argument to be made that absent, you know, 100 plus a barrel oil, there's a chance that we can weather five plus percent interest rates without topping into recession. Uh, ISM order is a really good predictor of recession, and we've broken through the recession line. Now, it's not deep, right, but it's there. We've hit that number, and so manufacturing is probably in a recession, and it's usually a good signal that the broader economy will be in a recession as well. Um, more good news, I would say, on the financial stress is that we surged during SVB and then settled back down. And so uh, these are pretty good indicators that things are okay. Like we haven't hit anything close to financial crisis. Um, problem is I'm not necessarily buying it. I think it's too early in this to give the all clear signal. I was at Wachovia when it all started and it took about 15 months before it showed up on everybody, Main Street's doorsteps, right? It doesn't work its way through the system overnight. We're three months in, we've had three of the four biggest bank bank failures in history, and we're all just acting like, no, nothing. It was just a blip. Everybody's good, right? Maybe it is good, but it feels a little weird to be giving the all clear signal at this point. Um, most notably to me is this bank term funding program that the Fed enacted um, as soon as SVB went under, which was, to me, a great measure. I'm all, all for this sort of intervention. The problem is, if everything's all clear, how come this window is still open. Why do we still have $100 billion in emergency funding out to banks right now? Why hasn't that dropped back down to zero and basically been turned off if everything's really all clear? They don't tell us who is borrowing this money for two years. So we don't know which banks might be borrowing this money in order to stay afloat, deal with whatever mark-to-market -market issues they might be having on treasuries and just trying to survive to the other side. So, yeah, we are you know, sound and resilient for the most part, but how much of that is because of the crutch 
that uh, the Fed is giving. Um, and how much of that is really just because the huge banks are going to be totally fine because they seem to be getting through this the best. Um, liquidity is going to be a theme going forward, right? Treasury liquidity is at really nasty levels. It's worse than it was during COVID. Um, and I think it's probably going to get worse. You know, this supply issue is going to cause bank reserves to, to drop and that's going to cause more issues. So I suspect that we will see the end of QT at some point here, second half of this year. Uh, Powell said yesterday that they have not ended QT. So I think it's something that they're monitoring, but I think they'll eventually have to throw in the towel and say, we can't continue to suck liquidity out of the market because it's actually having ramifications. Uh, the credit availability, I think, is going to be a big role. Powell himself has said it, it It substitutes for some amount of rate hikes. He doesn't know. I think the general consensus is usually kind of like one or two hikes. You know, the reason why I think they're done. Um, in their mind, they're like, you know what? This is probably going to take care of itself. If we can just, we can just buy ourselves time without inflation expectations spiking, this stuff is going to grind to a halt, and we're going to move into a slower part of economic growth. Um, unfortunately, the next one doesn't come out until right after the next Fed meeting. So uh, they tend to get a sneak peek, and I assume that they'll be looking at that, and that might uh, influence their decision. But even the last one, which came out in just the first couple of weeks post-SCB, where they hadn't really felt the effects yet, uh, it was already dramatically worse. So I think it'll probably be even worse next, uh, the next one that's released. And then lastly, leading indicators, um, deeply negative, definitely in recession territory. This suggests that we will have a recession in the next 12 months. I agree with this assessment. Uh, I think the Fed will be cutting probably Q1 next year, maybe Q2 if they can drag it out. Um, but I think that we're definitely headed for a recession. I don't know how bad it'll be, but uh, I, don't, I don't have any expectation of it being terrible. Um, I think for those of us in the transaction business, it's probably been the worst it's going to be. Um, so we'll probably see more transactions going forward. And I think that that brings me to my favorite Father's Day gift, which was my wife realizing how the last couple had gone, decided to intervene and say, you know what, for Father's Day this year, um, we're going to go to a matinee. We're going to see back-to-back -back movies. And so we took all five kids, went to see back-to-back -back movies, about five hours of total silence, um, candy, and probably two or three naps as well. So that ended up being my favorite Father's Day gift. And a uh, big shout out to the wife for, for, for uh, identifying that. So with that, I know we've used up most of our time. I'll press pause. And Sarah, if you have any uh, questions that come in, you want to go over, just just let me know. Uh, we did get a lot of uh, suggestions about future Father's Day. So I'll, oh, I'll nice. save those uh, yeah, surprises. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we had a couple of dad jokes come through, or lots of dad jokes, actually, nice. and then a couple of questions. So uh, first, uh, thoughts on the impact of the end of student debt relief in August on consumption, inflation, and interest rates? Yeah, I think it's bad um, that that a lot of that spending that's occurred in the last three years has been because people have been spending their money on student loan repayments. And so having to put your money towards that is absolutely going to take money away from consumption. And that's going to flow through to to um, to the GDP numbers. Consumer spending is two thirds of GDP. So it's absolutely going to have an impact. Uh, we had a dad joke. Why do cows wear bells? I don't know. Because their horns don't work. Amazing. Nice. <laughs> That's yeah. a good one. Grown. Um, can you uh, can you discuss the amount and direction of pressure from the Biden administration on the Fed? Is it really a factor? Uh, I think it's less of a factor right now. I think it was a factor when Powell was up for uh, renomination. I think that the Biden administration probably applied a ton of pressure at that point, and I suspect there will be a lot of pressure later on this year, right? Like right now, there's not enough economic weakness for Biden to really feel the pressure that he has to go, you know, apply that to, to Jay Powell. Um, Powell's term goes through the next election, so I don't know how much sleep he's losing, but I suspect get into next year and everything has slowed down the way I think it's gonna slow down. And I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure from the White House on, on the Fed to um, start cutting and easing conditions and to ease them enough in advance of the election to Im influence it. Uh, when will the curve uninvert? So the, the curve only ever uninverts 
after the Fed has started cutting rates. There's never been a time when it, it inverts and then, you know, it just takes care of itself and the 10 year says, oh, my bad, we were wrong. We should be north of Fed funds and the 10 year runs up to 6%. So we have an uninverted curve. Um, the only way that this curve uninverts is Fed funds gets cut. And so if it's at five and a quarter ish, um, it needs to, to drop it back down to, you know, sort of three ish percent. Um, I think that the best case scenario for that is probably middle of next year and probably towards the second half of next year. All right. We've got one more question and one more dad joke. Um, do you think they will hike two more times? I do not. Um, I think that there is some chance that they hike one, once more. Um, and, uh, you know, I put those odds at probably 25%. I, I think it's less likely than most people think. Um, I think that they were just trying to buy themselves time while simultaneously keeping a lid on expectations. I think two times only happens if inflation reverses course. If we see inflation actually go back up, then yes, they would hike again. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and I don't see them hiking twice. So I think it's none most likely or one. And then end of August, we have Jackson Hole and they signal shift that we're done. And the next move is a cut. All right, and last dad joke for you. Um, I'm not a father, but I love dad jokes. I'm a faux pas. Nice. There you I go. Know. It's good. It's very well, good. I'm a dad. You can borrow one of my kids if you need one. <laughs> we have plenty, that's for sure. <laughs> well, well, remember, we will send out the slides and the, the recording of the webinar after this. Um, any last words, JP? No, thank you for, for listening. We'll talk to you in probably September. Um, we'll have a much greater clarity around what the Fed is going to be doing about that time, whether they're uh, actively moving into cutting mode. Um, and everybody have a great Father's Day weekend. Thanks for joining, everybody. See you next time. See ya.